I loved hearing bedtime stories. Uh, and when we became parents, uh, Lori and I uh, would share bedtime stories with our kids too. Uh, it's important to hear stories, to know stories, maybe of a family or extended family. You probably share stories with your kids if you're parents or grandparents with your grandchildren. It's important to know about our families. It's important to hear stories, for example, fairy tales of good winning over evil, or important to hear stories that Jesus tells, like the prodigal son or the good Samaritan. Because hearing of stories, especially God's story, help to shape us. They help to give us our identity. They help to remind us who we are through the telling of stories, whether it be some of the great novels and classics or simple stories, deep and treasured truth is communicated. So today, I want to invite you to pretend that it's bedtime, all right? It's bedtime, and you're going to hear a story. I don't want you to go to sleep, though. No sleeping. It's like that old joke. Somebody said, hey, pastor, how many people does this sanctuary seat? He said, I don't know, but it sleeps 500 every Sunday morning. We don't want you to go to sleep, but you got to pretend it's bedtime, and we're going to tell a story. And it's one of the great stories of the Old Testament. It's a great story of Scripture, the story of Esther. We shared this story maybe five or six years ago. We haven't looked at Esther since. But uh, if you know the story, you, certainly it's good for us to hear stories over and over again. So here's the story of Esther. Once upon a time, there was a king who ruled the whole world, all the way from India to Ethiopia. And this king's name was Xerxes. Everybody say Xerxes. Now Xerxes, long story short, he needs a new queen. So he orders the prettiest women from all 127 provinces in the land to be paraded before him so that he may choose the loveliest of all as his wife, as his queen, and he chooses Esther. Now, King Xerxes doesn't know it at the time, but Esther is an orphan, and she is a Jew. Some of the Jews, after the exile, you remember the Jewish people were in exile for a number of years in Babylonia, and uh, some of the Jews, many of them were led back to the promised land after the exile, but some of them stayed in Babylon, and Esther was there with her uncle Mordecai, staying in Persia or in Babylon, and she is chosen to be the new queen. So Esther marries King Xerxes, but now things get pretty somber. Enter the villain. There is a villain in this story, and he is the king's, he's King Xerxes' right-hand man, and his name is Haman. Everybody say Haman. Haman. Now, I did this with you once before, but Haman is so bad that whenever I mention his name, Haman... I want you, because he's the villain, to boo and hiss. Okay, let's try it. Haman. All right, he's a villain. He's a bad guy. This guy is so self-absorbed. He's so arrogant. Last night the band said, how arrogant is he? He's so arrogant that he orders everybody to bow down to him whenever he walks by. Imagine that. Try that at home. See how that works. He orders everybody to bow down to him whenever he walks by. That's how arrogant he is. But there is one, Esther's uncle Mordecai, who worships God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he says, I refuse to bow down to Haman. So, this villain, Haman... Nicely done. He concocts this plan to get rid of Mordecai. And not just Mordecai, he wants to get rid of all of Mordecai and Esther's people, the Jews that are living in Babylon. And so he gets King Xerxes to sign an edict 
He tricks King Xerxes. The king doesn't quite know what he's signing. He tricks King Xerxes into signing this edict that on the 13th day of the, using the old calendar, uh, the month of Adar, that all of the Jews, including Mordecai, are going to be put to death. It is an awful, awful deal. This villain thinks he's winning the day. And of course, the Jews, including Mordecai, they're in a panic. So Mordecai sends word to Queen Esther. Esther, remember, is secretly a Jew. She's in the palace, and, she, and uh, Mordecai begs her to go to the king to explain this evil scheme and to get the king to change his edict, to remember her people, the Jews, and to save them. But Esther's nervous. Why is she nervous? Because in that day it was a very patriarchal system, and so no one could approach the king without being summoned, not even the queen. She was risking her life going to the king unannounced without being summoned by him. The penalty was often death. But then Mordecai utters, I think, what are the most famous words out of this Old Testament story of Esther, the book of Esther. He says this to her. He says, Esther, who knows? Maybe you have been put in this place for just such a time as this. In other words, Esther, maybe you have been placed and have been made into royalty, that God has been working behind the scenes to put you in this place to influence King Xerxes to save your people, the Jews. And so brave Esther, she goes to the king, she puts her own life on the line, and as it turns out, King Xerxes is happy to see her, Again, to make a long story short, I encourage you to read the book. If you haven't, read the book. It doesn't take that long. But to make a long story short, Haman, thank you, his evil plan is exposed, and instead of having Mordecai die and get the death penalty in all of the Jews, it is Haman who gets the death penalty by order of the king, and Haman is impaled on this 75-foot pole. It's rather a gruesome scene. It's a pole that he himself had built to kill Mordecai upon, but uh, this villain gets the death penalty. He dies. The villain is killed. The Jews are spared. And to this day, the Jews celebrate the festival of Purim in honor of this courageous and beautiful woman named Esther and her heroic acts. It is a great, great story. But as is the case with all of Scripture, we need to ask a question of this story. We need to ask a question. Every time you read the Bible, you need to ask this question. Every time I dig into God's Word and prepare a sermon, I ask this question. And we need to ask this question of Esther today. And the question is simply this, so what? Everybody say, so what? We need to ask the Bible, so what does this have to do with us today? What does this have to do with your life? What does it have to do with my life? What does it have to do with this world? And I simply want to briefly answer that question, so what, in two ways, two things. Number one is this. Like we see so often in the Old Testament, as we've been moving through this series, taking a look at Old Testament characters like Abraham and Sarah and the sacrifice of Isaac and Joseph and Moses leading the people out of slavery and Ruth and David and others, this story of Esther gives us a foretaste. It gives us a hint of what God is going to do someday in the person of Jesus. For the people of the Old Testament, they were looking for, longing for a Messiah, for a Savior, and the story of Esther gives to them a clue about what God's going to do on a much broader scale when the Messiah finally shows up. You think about it. Things look bleak back in Esther's day for the Jewish people. You don't have to boo and hiss anymore, but Haman's scheme for this evil and death looks to be winning the day. 
Haman thought that his plan was going to come to fruition, that Mordecai and all of the Jews were going to be put to death, but what does God do? God steps in in a surprising way. He uses Esther to save God's people from destruction. You see, God's story of salvation wins in the end. Now fast forward to the Messiah, fast forward to Jesus. From the very beginning, the devil, let's call the devil the villain, if you want to look in those, think about it in those terms, the devil, the villain, thinks that his plot of sin and evil and death are going to win the day. All the way from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane, the devil thinks he's going to win. But what does God do? God steps in. He steps in in Jesus, and Jesus defeats Satan first in the wilderness when he's tempted, and he stares down the devil, but then again on the cross and most fully in the resurrection, God crushes Satan's head, and sin and death and evil are done away with. You see, God's plan of salvation comes to fruition in Jesus Christ, and we're given a foretaste of that in the book of Esther. And now by faith in Jesus, you can know that you have been given that same gift that was given to the Jews back in Esther's day of salvation, but not just for now. Yes, for now. We have life here and now, but it is meant for eternity, forever. And it's the best news ever, and we're given a foretaste of it many, many times in the Old Testament. Second point is this. Mordecai's words to Esther become God's words to you. They become God's words to us. Mordecai says to Esther, remember, he says, Esther, who knows? Maybe you were put here in your particular circumstance, in your particular situation for just such a time as this, to make a difference for God, to make a difference for Christ wherever it is that you are planted. So hear God's word to you today, people of Glory Day. Insert your name. Sally, Jim, Mary, Tom, insert your name. Maybe, just maybe, God has placed you in this particular time and in this particular place in your life to accomplish what needs to be done for God for such a time as this. You know that you were created by God. You know that you have been set free by the blood of Christ for a reason. And that reason is not simply to just eat, drink, and be merry. There are times in life when, yes, we want to celebrate and eat, drink, and be merry, but there is much more to life than just that. You were created and you were set free by Christ and His cross and His resurrection for a purpose, for a reason. To go out there, to get out there from this place, to go out into the world and make a difference for Christ in people's lives in whatever way you can. I truly believe, and in fact, I truly know that God places you into situations and into circumstances. Sometimes they're challenging, I know, but to make a difference. We said to the twins today as they were baptized, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That is all of the purpose given to all of us, to let our light shine where we are planted. Now you may say, well, preacher boy, I'm never going to be a queen. I'm never going to be a king. I'm never going to be president. What can I do? Well, you're probably not going to be queen or king or president. But keep in mind that through Jesus, you are made into royalty. You are made into royalty by Christ. You are a sister or a brother of Jesus Christ, the given Messiah. Think about that. You are a child of your heavenly Father, of the God who created all of this, who created you. You are a child of God. You are royalty, and you need to see yourself by faith in that way. Think about Esther. She was a poor orphan girl. She had humble beginnings. She was used by God. She was a rather ordinary person, used in extraordinary ways. The same for you. God uses you. He turns you into royalty, and he says, I'm going to do, and I am doing, extraordinary things through you, in your life, in your circumstance, in your situation. 
Last month, Gloria Day was collecting rolls of toilet paper for necessities for neighbors. Other churches were doing other things. And we had a goal of collecting 1,500 rolls of toilet paper, and you outdid that goal by reaching about 1,700 rolls of toilet paper. That's awesome. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. This month, as I mentioned in the announcements, we're on a food drive. We're collecting for the mobile food pantry hearty cans of soup. And I was talking with Pastor Chris about it, and Chris is heading this up, but we said, you know, what kind of goal should we have at Glory Day? And no matter what it is that we, we reach in giving soup, God's going to take that and do extraordinary things with it. But we said, you know, if we had 500 cans that were brought in uh, between now and the next three weeks, there would be, for every family that comes and is in need, about two to three cans of soup for the month. And that's pretty good. And then we started thinking, you know, what if we collected a thousand cans of soup? Maybe every family would receive five to six cans of soup for the month. That would be great. And then we thought, you know, what if we set a goal for 1,500? What if we had 1,500 cans of soup all stacked out there and every family that was in need of food for the month would get seven or eight cans of soup for the month? That's awesome. That makes a real impact. So I encourage you, if you are able, when you're at the grocery store in the next few weeks, buy some hearty cans of soup and the good stuff and bring it here and uh, we're going to give it away. It's going to be awesome. And if you're not able to do that, I know you give of yourselves in many, many other ways. We heard Joe sing about simple gifts. It's in the simple ways that you and I can make a difference in people's lives. We have a lot of people who are volunteering their time, being church school teachers and Sunday school teachers and helpers and aides and confirmation mentors and so many others around you. You know God is doing extraordinary things through you. A few weeks ago, I was uh, able to lead worship for Church on the Street. Uh, I was uh, out at Heritage Park in Sioux Falls, an outdoor service that Gloria Day is very much involved with, and uh, it ministers to the homeless population in Sioux Falls, and I was able, privileged enough to bring the message that day. And it was a short message in which I simply started by telling them that they were children of God, just like we do here, that they're men and women and children of God, that God loves them. But then I told them a story about my friends, Andy and Sarah, Andrew and Sarah. They've been married for 50 years. And I asked Andrew, I said, you know, what's the secret to your marriage of 50 years? How'd that go? And he said, well, you know, uh, when we were first married, said 50 years ago, my father-in-law, Sarah's dad, gave me a wedding gift. And that wedding gift was a nice watch. And he said, I looked at the watch and I saw that on the glass of the watch's face, there were etched in the glass simple words. And the words were these. It says simply, say something nice to Sarah. Say something nice to Sarah. So he said, you know, every time for 50 years, I was looking at the watch to see what time it was and I was reminded to say something nice to my wife, to say something nice to Sarah. And he said he took that as a reminder not only to say something, but to do something. True story. And he said he tried to live that out for 50 years. Say something nice to Sarah. Friends, you and I can do that too. In whatever ways God calls us, we, there are lots and lots of voices in this world. There are a lot and lot of voices in our culture that are critical voices, that are criticizing people, that are pulling people down, dragging people down. In a simple way, God says, you know what, I'm going to use you in a profound way to be an alternate voice, to be a Christian voice that raises people up, that encourages people, that provides a good word, saying something nice, doing something simple for someone to make their life better, whether it's someone in your family or whether it's a complete stranger. Jesus says, it's in the simple things that I show up. He said that uh, anyone who gives even a cup of cold water to one of these my little ones, my loved ones will surely not lose his or her reward. Fifty years later, my friend Andy said he's received so many rewards, so many blessings by simply saying something and doing something nice for his wife for 50 years. We do that, as I said, for one another, for strangers, for family. So today, Gloria Day, hear this. Don't you ever, ever, ever underestimate what God can do and what God is doing in your life. In your life, he's doing extraordinary things. The neighborhoods around here, 
these homes and apartments that are being built up. There are people living in these neighborhoods. They are ripe with people who are longing to know purpose in their life. They are longing to know what it is that can fill that hole in their soul, and you have the answer. That answer is Jesus Christ crucified and risen who calls you, maybe you won't have to risk your life for your faith, you probably won't like Esther did, but maybe you'll be at a dinner party somewhere and you'll be talking with someone, getting to know somebody, and they'll share with you something going on in their life. Maybe it's a challenge, maybe it's a difficult circumstance that they're walking through, and you'll be able to speak, you'll be able to say something kind, something encouraging, and you will be able to share Hey, you know what? I've gone through some challenges in my life too. I've gone through some real low points in my life too. Here's how I get through it. I know that God loves me. I know that he loves me enough to send Jesus to die for me. And you can share a little bit about how it is that you walk through this life and the hope that you have, not only for life here and now, but life everlasting. That opportunity happens over and over and over again if we simply see with eyes of faith God's present using you, using me to let our light shine for others. So stories are important. It's important to know the story of Esther. It's important to know the stories of salvation that shape your very identity of a God who loves you as a child of God who calls you in simple ways to go out and make a difference for him. So this great story of Esther, go home and read it, get to know it. It will remind you of Christ's salvation and plan of salvation for you. And it will also remind you that God is saying to you, just like Mordecai said to Esther, maybe, just maybe, the Lord is calling you for just such a time as this. I know it's true, it's true. So go from here with eyes of faith, paying attention, knowing you're saved in Jesus Christ with a purpose, a purpose to make a difference for others in Christ's name. Amen. Now may the peace of God, that peace which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.